Hello everyone and welcome to The Green Flame, the deep green resistance broadcast that brings you radical analysis, practical skills, and artistic expression from the revolutionary movement to defend the planet and rebuild just human communities. I am your host and comrade, Max Wilbert. Today's interview is with Anne Kale Kelly, a filmmaker, journalist, podcaster, and writer. She's also an organizer. Kiala's published articles and op-eds have appeared in the Honolulu Star Advertiser, The Nation, Indian Country Today, Honolulu Weekly and Civil Beat, Hanahau Magazine, Big Island Journal, and other publications. Her broadcast journalism has aired on Free Speech Radio News, Independent Native News, Al Jazeera English, The News Hour with Jim Lair, Democracy Now!, The Environment Report, and more. She is a frequent guest commentator on First Voices Indigenous Radio and has been interviewed on numerous nationally syndicated radio programs, from KPFK Los Angeles's Rise Up to Native America Calling in Anchorage to the Australia Broadcast Corporation's Pacific Beat. Her reporting on Hawaiian poverty and homelessness garnered her Native American Journalism Awards, and her documentary, Noho Heva, The Wrongful Occupation of Hawaii, has received International Film Festival awards and is widely taught in university courses, focusing on indigenous peoples, colonization, Hawaiian sovereignty, and militarism. Keala is an outspoken Native advocate for indigenous representation in media and has been a guest speaker at universities in Hawaii, the U.S., and Aotearoa, New Zealand. She has delivered conference keynotes and participated in conference and community panels and roundtables. She has an MFA in production from the UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television. For more information about her work, you can visit her website, annkealakelly.com. I'm so glad to be joined by you, Keala, for today's show, and I'm looking forward to asking you about your book. So let's dive right in. First of all, aloha, Max, and mahalo nui for having me on your show. I appreciate the chance to talk about this I always refer to it as a little book or the the manifesto. Can you tell us about why you wrote this book, Our Rights to Self-Determination, a Hawaiian manifesto? The reason I wrote this is because it started literally uh, two years ago this week when Deb Holland was announced by then President-elect Biden as his pick to be the Secretary of the Department of Interior. So this was probably about a month after the election. And at that time, Kai Kahele had been elected to Congress to represent uh, his district on, uh, in Hawaii, I think on Oahu. So when I saw that these two people were basically coming into power along with the Biden administration that would be taking place, I was really disturbed because one of the things Kai Kahele said right after he was elected, he said, that he was going to push for reparations for Native Hawaiians. So when I saw these two things aligning, I was just, it was kind of upsetting to see after, I've been at this for 22 years now, just my participation in the Hawaiian sovereignty movement and doing media and whatever I can, mainly being a political agitator. And I just understood that this meant that structurally, institutionally, the United States was going to make a fresh attempt at turning Hawaiians into a Native American tribe. So that was what was the thing that made me feel that something needed to be written down and said. And then I started working on it probably a few weeks later. I didn't know it was going to be published as a little book, by the way. It was took some months to do after I had a pretty strong draft. I made an attempt to get it published by the Honolulu Civil Beat, which is uh, Pierre Omidyar's publication. It's a digital publication. And they wanted nothing to do with it. (laughs) So one of the editors there, she was really, I mean, she was great, Julia Steele. And she had said to me, she was the one who had said to me, Kayla, this isn't just anything. She said, this is a manifesto. And we talked quite a bit. And then she came up with the idea of approaching the Atlantic. Because this thing's 12,000 words long. So it's like there's very few places where you can publish something this long. So I did end up through her approaching the Atlantic. And ultimately, I had a pretty good conversation with Adrienne LaFrance, who's the editor. And they agreed, you know, she said, yeah, they would run it. 
So I was really just relieved that somebody was going to publish this very long, very difficult piece. And then a couple weeks later, there was a change of heart. So that's what ultimately I ended up having to do it myself because it, it still needed a home. It's probably a long answer to a short question, but. Well, I'm, I'm sad to hear that because the Atlantic would have been such a big audience. But, you know, for those who don't know the context of this, I'm going to recommend you go back and listen to episode 12 of this podcast about colonization, where we had another in-depth conversation with you. And we dove into this whole topic of federal, so-called federal recognition, right? And what that looks like. And it's an interesting one because for many different tribes on the mainland here in the United States, what's now known as the United States, occupied land of many different nations, there are various tribes which have not been recognized as such by the federal government and which are seeking federal recognition. So you have a lot of tribes in the Bay Area, all the Ohlone peoples. Uh, you have the, the Duwamish people, for example, where I grew up in what's now known as Seattle, who are seeking federal recognition. And I think it's probably a new concept for some of our listeners that you and many Native Hawaiians don't want federal recognition. So I know we talked about that in detail on the last show, but would you mind summarizing you know, why that is and why you, know, you see this as actually sort of a, a, a deeper anti-colonial perspective or a more important perspective, an important stand for you and Hawaiian people to take on this issue? Yeah, that's another reason to, that I wrote this. Our rights to self-determination have absolutely nothing to do with the United States of America's federal apparatus. Our rights predate any American involvement here. Americans especially don't want to know that when Hawaiians say that we are an illegally occupied country, we're actually talking about the fact that our history is that we are a nation state. And when I say nation state, I mean on par with the United States, with every other nation state out there. And we have that history. You know, I write about it, especially at the beginning of the book, where I'm talking about just the fact that the first state dinner at the White House was for King Kalakaua. It wasn't for somebody from France. It wasn't for some white person. It was for the Hawaiian king. So our history goes way, way back. You know, in 1893, when the U.S. conducted its military overthrow of Lili Ookalani's government and removed her from power, and then five years later, conveniently took unilateral control of Hawaii. All of these things that were done during those years were attempts to annex Hawaii to the United States. They couldn't get a treaty of annexation through Congress. And there's a number of reasons why that's true, but one of them is because we're a country. And I say this a lot. If the United States wanted to annex Canada, there'd have to be a treaty of annexation. If they wanted to annex Mexico, there'd have to be a treaty of annexation. And those are two countries that actually border the United States. Hawaii is 20, almost 2,500 miles away. And so there's nothing about the U.S. takeover of Hawaii and the ongoing occupation that's ever been legal. So it's not just immoral, it's illegal. Like I said, Americans really don't want to know about that. It's easier to just put us into this category of indigenous and talk about colonization and decolonization. We have this other more complicated reality. And that is, yes, we're an indigenous people. We're the original people here. And we're also, we have this nation state history. So as Hawaiian people, it's not just me. It's not just an opinion. It's a reality that we embody. And we, therefore, cannot fit into a federal Native American tribal status of any kind. All that ever has been, and I make the argument pretty strong in the book, all that ever has been is a cover-up of the original crime, which is the U.S. overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. So... Maybe I'll try and say that in a slightly different way, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. But it sounds like, you know, part of what you're saying, part of what you say in the book is that if the Hawaiian people accept federal recognition as a quote unquote Native American tribe, then that is in some ways a capitulation to the original the original crime of the illegal coup and occupation of Hawaii. It will be narrated as acquiescence. In fact, in American think, uh, the fact that up in January 2023, it'll be 130 years since the overthrow. 
And in American think that means so much time has passed, you people should just get over it. They were saying that 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 60, it's always like that with Americans. They think that we're lucky and we should be grateful for the theft and destruction of our nation and our place. And so any kind of, even just a tiny little fragment of federal power that Hawaiians agree to is narrated as us agreeing to being American. And the fact is, Hawaiians have never agreed to be American. The problem is now, you know, like I said, I saw this, as soon as I saw who was going to be, who the native faces would be that would be talking about Hawaii, that's Deb Holland and Kai Kahele. And as soon as I saw that, I said, we're screwed. You know, on the other side of these kind of the, the machinations of American governmental pressure for Hawaiians to go along to get along, right, is the reality that we are dealing with in Hawaii. For me, looking at all sides of it and understanding the threat, the reason it's a threat is because Hawaiians are too busy trying to survive these other assaults that are clear and present dangers to our survival here. So they're not, it's not always eyes on the prize. You see a Hawaiian or you see a native these days and everybody assumes, oh, all the indigenous people, they're all in something together. No, Kaikahele is a military man, period, end. And so is Deb Holland. These are American military people. These are American government people. These are not, you know, I, I would never look to Deb Holland to be on my side as Kanaka Maoli. She's only going to be on the side of Kanaka Maoli who are selling us out. And I can name who they are. There's Hawaiians up in D.C. who have offices. The Office of Hawaiian Affairs, which is a state agency, has an office there. The CNHA, Council for Native Hawaiian Advancement, so-called advancement, has an office there. So there are people who are really engaged with the federal government trying to create the illusion that Hawaiians are acquiescing to being American. For instance, if people are familiar with Alaska Natives, there's a lot of so-called tribes or nations there, but then there's these corporations. So you have these Alaska Native corporate entities, and they function as federally recognized tribes. But it's all about business. It's about money. It's about profit. Who's going to control what? You know, who gets to control the oil up there, right? And who gets to profit from it? So it's the same thing in Hawaii. We're the military stronghold for the U.S. They've planted their military empire here, which helps them control the Pacific and Asia. And any talk about our actual rights, our actual rights to self-determination, that can't be allowed to go on in the U.S. system. Because any real discussion ultimately leads to the logical conclusion, which is that the United States has no jurisdiction. And I write about that in the book as well. They can't even prove their jurisdiction. So rather than address the actual history and what's happening to the Hawaiian people and has been happening for 130 years, they'll just cover it up with another bullshit federal process. So, for instance, we had President Clinton and his so-called apology bill. So there's that, right? Or statehood itself is fake. Even that is phony. So every single so-called legal process that has taken place here over the past 130 years has been the opposite, has been a lie. But now Hawaiians are worn out, <laughs> you know, and distracted. And for me, being who I am and looking at what, you know, seeing what I'm seeing, it's, it's really quite a terrifying time right now because we have so many things happening to us right now. And trying to get Hawaiians to understand, look, there's this larger thing coming, like a meteor from Washington, D.C. is going to land square on top of us. It's very, very challenging. It's really interesting to hear this, and I'm sure that some of the listeners may be challenged in some ways by some of what you're saying. I'm sure many will agree with you, but some may be challenged. You know, I'm thinking about last year, Deb Holland was sworn in March, and we were just a few months into the fight at Thacker Pass at that time. We were beginning to work pretty closely with a bunch of the Northern Paiute and Western Shoshone community in the area, the Native community. and there was hope among some people that Deb Holland would overturn the approval of the Thacker Pass project. She's head of Department of the Interior, has direct oversight over the BLM, and that she would see that this was a sacred site, a culturally important site, and do something on our behalf. I saw that sort of wishful thinking, especially among liberal people, to be frank, 
liberal people, both native and non-native, who have a sense of trust in the government. But, you know, my feeling was I've been down that road before. You know, when I was pretty young and President Obama got elected, I made the mistake of thinking that because his rhetoric was so good, because he was a black man, you know, changing literally the complexion of the federal government in a way that had never been seen before, that he was truly going to represent some sort of phase change in the way the society was going. And I very naively made that mistake. Very quickly, I became aware of that mistake because I already had a radical background. And as soon as he actually got into power and started making decisions, it became very clear, you know, literally within weeks of him getting in office based on who he was appointing to um, his cabinet and so on, that things were going to continue down the business as usual imperialist death culture route. So I've been down that road before. So I had a sense that Deb Holland wasn't going to come through like an angel for us. But I'm wondering if that's something that you see as well going on in Hawaii, because I think in your book, you speak to the fact that some Native Hawaiian people do want federal recognition because there are, of course, tangible benefits associated with that in terms of maybe some funding for different types of programs and so on. It's sort of like these bones that get handed out. Is that correct? And how is that playing out? How do you see that? You talked about the, the Hawaiian senator. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, Congressman, yeah. He was, as of, when is that, in January? He didn't run for re-election, so he won't be there next time. He was hardly there this time, actually. He was in Hawaii most of the time because of the pandemic. So the way it works is, and I, and I think this could be true for any colonial occupation, displacement situation anywhere, okay? There's just certain things that happen systematically. I'm inclined to look at certain issues now and, and see, like, for instance, I've been thinking about and talking a lot about West Papua lately. Because that's a really good example of something a lot more violent happening to those people. But and and I'll try to circle back to your original question in a second. But West Papua is relevant because it too is in the Pacific, and it got done to exactly the same way that the Hawaiian people got done to right after World War II. And I talk about this a little bit in the book. We were on the list of non-self-governing territories to be decolonized. So was West Papua, and. What happened for us is that the U.S. did a fake statehood vote. It was fake. It was illegal how they did it. And the U.N. agreed. And the same thing happened with the people of West Papua during the Kennedy administration. They did a swapity do and it ended up, they ended up being removed from that list by the end of the 60s and pretty much just handed over to Indonesia. I mean, there's a lot of history in between those two things, but it, it was a very similar process where something fake had taken place in this moment when countries were being so-called decolonized after World War II. The way that it works here in Hawaii is that certain Hawaiians, they will go along with something that's federal or state because yes, they want money. They want to get money for themselves and their families and their own personal small projects. They don't want to have to be responsible for the overall historical reality. They'd rather just use that history as an excuse to get funded. So that's why you end up with like a nonprofit industrial complex. That's all up in the Hawaiian sovereignty movement's business. You've got state Hawaiians who have comfortable, what I call comfortable American lifestyles that they get to live because they have pretty decent paying jobs, if not really good paying jobs. And they have retirement funds and they have health insurance. They have all these great things in this most expensive place to live. And they don't want to give it up. You know, I often say, the Hawaiians who profit from the occupation of Hawaii will not dismantle the occupation of Hawaii because it's benefiting them. So it doesn't matter if somebody has a brown face or a black face or a purple face. It, it doesn't really matter because people let their personal interests become the driver of their politics. I would say at that point, they just don't even have politics. They don't have principles at that point because that is just a very American attitude to take. So we have what I know in Indian country, they'll refer sometimes to natives as apples, red on the outside, white on the inside. And over here, we use the word coconut. So somebody might be brown on the outside, but really holly on the inside. And then, you know, to the person who's one or two steps away from that degrees of separation, they look at it as you did with Obama and they go, wait, look, this is, they sound great. They look great. This is going to be really good for our people. And then when they start to take action, 
that goes in the opposite direction, this is the part, Max, and help me understand this if you can. Let's turn this into a therapy session for Keala because Keala needs therapy, especially when she starts talking in third person like that. I don't understand why people can't see that if somebody is going to drive the herd off of the cliff, they still go along. Because clearly, Obama, it, it was clear, like you said, right from the beginning, who owned and operated this person, okay? We all still hoped. We held on. We did. We tried. And then it got clearer and clearer. And then people were less and less inclined to try to unpack that. So then they just keep going along as if their conscience is going to get cleaned on this person, right? I think it's the same thing with indigenous right now. You say indigenous and everybody grabs onto that like it's some kind of safe zone and not the exploitation project that it ultimately still is, you know? So that's being done to us by the government. It's being done to us by corporations. It's being done to us by industries. Just because someone is native Hawaiian or Kanaka Maoli, however they're going to identify, does not mean they really care about our rights. And what the word that we use is kuleana. That means we have a, we have a responsibility. And that is our responsibility. As the indigenous people of this place, we have a responsibility that has nothing to do with what other people do. We still have that responsibility, even though we are inundated with Americans and with the terrible things that they do here to our place. So help me understand how, why do people go along? Why do they stay going along? It's a huge question and I'm probably not the best expert to answer that kind of thing, but it makes me think about Stockholm syndrome. It makes me think about the psychology of abuse where, you know, when somebody has been abused to a certain point, they'll internalize the lessons of that abuse and it won't, won't even be conscious. They won't be making conscious decisions of I'm going to go along with the abuser, you know, to preserve myself so that I can escape later, they will just start to identify with those who have hurt them in the past. And part of the reality too is Gail Dines, she was talking about patriarchy, but it applies in this situation as well. She said, systems of oppression, they gain strength when they are flexible enough to absorb members of the oppressed class. And that to me is something that there's a lot of truth and wisdom in that, because if you look at what Obama did for American empire, from the perspective of American empire, he may have been the most successful president in quite a long time. From the perspective of the planet, he was a disaster. From the perspective of the black community in this country, I think in many ways he was a, a, a major disappointment. And that idea that systems of oppression, not just can continue to function while absorbing members of oppressed classes, but they actually thrive off of that, I think says a lot about, about how these systems work. And that goes back, I mean, I've been spending so much time studying the snake war and the colonization of the lands now known as Nevada, and the collaboration of some Native people with the government, with the army, has been a critical part of colonization from the very beginning. And you see these sort of divide and conquer strategies being used, you know, from the first moments that, that Europeans landed in this society. And of course, elsewhere around the world on all sorts of different lands where colonial and imperialist efforts have played out. You see that same type of strategy, which I think is the brilliance of, you know, people like Tecumseh who advocated for a sort of pan-indigenous resistance on this continent and, and uh, you know, made some serious strides towards actually halting the westward expansion of, of the American empire before he was killed. I don't know if that's helpful, Kayla, but those are some of the thoughts that come to my mind. Mm -hmm. No, I think I, I'm not going to disagree with you. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I also think that, uh, and this is just life experience, I think that I always call it the um, white innocence project. People want to have... And it's not just white people, but it's just like this idea of like, well, if, if, if so-and-so, like if this Hawaiian leader, quote unquote leader, says this is good, then I'm going to believe him. And I'm not even going to question that because he is just, you know, I, I trust him. And then that way, the Hawaiian or the thousand Hawaiians or the million, well, there's not a million of us, but, you know, however many thousands of Hawaiians go along with that, it kind of creates this zone of innocence where... 
Uh, I think that people don't want to be responsible. I think there's the Stockholm syndrome. Yes. There's also just like, I'd rather somebody else be the guilty party. In other words, I think a lot of times these days, people consider like not saying something as a kind of innocence zone. And it's just complicity. Silence is complicity. I'm not going to see it another way, especially if you're educated on any of these issues like colonization. To me, if you can spell colonization, you can spell decolonization. And, and that means you have a set, you can do something. So going further into the system that is dispossessing you, that has historically, you know, for us guys, it's historically hated Hawaiians. It has historically only taken from Hawaiians to go into that system and go, hmm, let's, let's look around in here and see if we can come to an agreement is the exact opposite direction one would go in if they actually were thinking about doing the right thing or just surviving, <laughs> just surviving at all. You know, I look at, I don't know if you've heard about the Red Hill fuel tanks on Oahu. It's called Red Hill. Have you heard about any of that? No. And this is just an example. This is a, so a day in the life of a Hawaiian right now in this moment. Okay. And this is our normal. So Red Hill is an area next to what people know as Pearl Harbor. That's the Indo-Pacific Command. It used to be just called Pacific Command, PACOM, but now they put the word Indo in there. So, because they want, they're talking about Asia and India and all of that. They want to, they changed the name a few years ago. So this is the largest military command on earth, is the one that's headquartered on Oahu. There have been these fuel tanks. They have this, this massive fuel tank. I think it's their largest outside of the U.S. fuel tank. It's there for the U.S. Navy. And it's been leaking for decades. And then last year, about almost exactly a year ago, a major leak took place and it went right into the aquifer. And it was such a major leak that it became like international news. Okay. Footage was eventually released of what this leak looked like. I mean, it breaks the heart to see it. Okay. So they've got this massive fuel tank sitting built intentionally on top of one of the main aquifers for Honolulu. Now, Oahu has probably the largest population. There's probably a million people over there. The way this gets narrated is that it's just military people that are affected, but it's the main aquifer for that whole part of the island. Anybody who understands anything knows that once you destroy an aquifer, you can't fix it. They've decommission those tanks and they're going to defuel them, but this is going to go on and on and on. They literally had another leak last week and it was like worse than fuel. It was, I forget what this substance is called, but it was like this worst contaminant got into the aquifer. It's like, that's a normal situation for us to deal with the fact that people cannot drink the water in that whole area now. People were getting sick, all kinds of terrible things have come out of that. And it hasn't, they haven't even begun to deal with the cleanup. This is going to go on and on. It's going to cost billions of dollars. It's going to go on and on. We'll be lucky if any of that aquifer survives what the military just did to it. And that's just a normal struggle that Hawaiians are in the front of. They're not the only ones in it because we have environmental groups, right? But that's going on as we speak. We also have the state insisting that it's going to make a new lease for Mauna Kea because the lease is up in 10 years. And so they're going to renew that lease. Instead of honoring the lease that they have, they're going to make a new lease for 100 years or 99 years. So that means Hawaiians would never have any hope of getting our mountain back. And, and so that's another point of struggle because we cannot let them renew that lease. They need to decommission the stuff that's up there already. Obviously, a TMT, a 30-meter telescope, is never going to get built there. And now they need to decommission the other stuff and honor the lease. So that's a, a place where... Even right now, I'm almost like a one-person agitating machine on that one issue. So we have this issue with the lease with regard to Mauna Kea and the state trying to renew it. And that's another hard thing happening. And then we also have this Hollywood machinery bearing down on us with three different major, you know, there's probably, I'm going to guess between the three projects that I'm talking about, there's probably half a billion dollars worth of Hollywood might coming in on literally on the Hawaiian culture. So, and that's going to create, that's, they're imagining that would generate billions in profit for them. So all of these things are happening at once for us. So it's really 
a very challenging moment because we have to deal with the environmental, the cultural, the historical. We have all these things happening at once and then just trying to get people to understand how this machinery of the United States government and American culture, how this project of American cultural imperialism and empire and militarism is really bearing down on us right now. It's, it's, a, it's a very challenging time to be Hawaiian, really, and to know any of this because it's all happening simultaneously. And we're not the only ones, I understand, we're not the only ones that get done to by that machine. We're getting done to in a way that we've never experienced before. And I think that Hawaiians at this moment, there's the ones who are looking for a place to be kind of innocent or kind of, you know, find a place of neutrality, which doesn't exist. And then there's the other ones who just don't know what to do. And then I'm going to guess, I'm going to say there's probably five or maybe even 10,000 Hawaiians who would go along with the federal thing. It's a small group of Hawaiians who will say, yeah, let's do the federal Uncle Sam thing. It's actually a small group. It's just that they're the ones that have the most power. They're the ones that have the most money. They're the ones that have the most education. They're the ones who are institutional. So they have this uh, kind of apparatus of uh, state and federal power that's already just theirs, you know, and they've already, they've been educated into doing what they're doing with that power instead of doing for their people. I, I feel like I just talk too much. I'm sorry. I keep doing that. <laughs> well, to jump back to the topic about therapy and link this together, because I feel like <laughs> I'm in therapy and I, I think we all need therapy, you know, in, in whatever different forms that look like, whether it's between you and a trained professional or between you and the forest or the mountain and the ocean and, uh, or between you and your family and your friends, you know, the, you and your ancestors, whatever form that sort of uh, grappling with these issues looks like. Because a big piece of this whole thing seems to me like there are so many people who are frozen by the amount of grief and the amount of pain that there is. And I'm hearing that in your voice as you're talking about the Red Hill oil tanks. And, you know, I've heard you speak before about the bombing ranges and you're talking about the Mauna Kea, the sacred mountain and the cultural colonization which you've written about before, Disney and uh, Hollywood coming in and sort of colonizing Hawaiian culture and monetizing Hawaiian culture, which is not a new process. Of course, the tourist tourism industry has been doing that for a long time, as you have also spoken very eloquently about in the past. And I'm thinking about my own experience, which is obviously not as a native Hawaiian, but as somebody who cares deeply about what's happening to our planet and has compassion for what people are going through, what the land is going through, what the animals and the water and the, all of these creatures are going through. Um, it's a lot. It's really a lot. And at times that weight is hard to bear. And my feeling is that a lot of people who would otherwise be taking action or doing something to change the world are paralyzed by that fear. And that seems to me like an intentional process of, once again, an abusive culture, an abusive civilization, that there's an understanding that by inflicting violence, inflicting suffering and harm, uh, you can create a situation of learned helplessness in people. I don't know if that rings true to you, Kayla, but I've seen that in a lot of people. And I know for myself, it's been a process you know, going back decades now of, of working to overcome that and, you know, figuring out how to, how to deal with those feelings and, you know, channel them towards, towards action, which I think is a, a better place of healing and a better place for us to move forward. Oh, no, I, I absolutely agree with you. I would even use the word terror. You see, I think that there's in that kind of system that you're describing and in that logic if you do that enough to a people, you can just terrorize them into silence. You can terrorize them into immobility, uh, make a person feel so oppressed or worthless or, you know, all of these things that they don't really even trust their decision as to which way to go. I feel like in the last couple of years, more than all the years put together, I've questioned my own ability to make a really good decision because so many of them have gone wrong. You know, so many things I've gone set out to do, even this little book, it's like, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Max, I cannot count how many times in a day I go, why did I do that for? You know, why did I do this thing where it 
took whatever money I could get my hands on and it took me, you know, it, the, the amount of work that went into it just to be able to speak in this kind of succinct way about these really huge meaty things. You know, it's basically a primer, really, if anybody wants to understand the history of this place and where we're at right now. But I often will, I'll just think, gosh, this is just, you know, it's so difficult and there's no point yet where I go, this is fulfilling. I feel so glad I did this. I mean, there's never been anything I've done in the past two decades where I've gone right on, Keala. You know, good job, sister. Like, I can't even say that to my own self because it's kind of thankless and it's postal. I mean, it never ends. It's a black hole, right? Because they've, the this, this system and the centuries of this system have made it a black hole. So I feel like, you know, just recently, and honestly, just in the past couple of months of having to speak out about the Jason Momoa thing has gotten me more using more of a kind of kue meaning a resistance kind of stance, like full on. Because if you're going to get into the ring, you better be willing to, you're going to get take a few. And you better give some back, right? You better make them sorry that they got in there too. And then I often talk recently just about being Irish, and I feel it. I feel this kind of Irish sensibility, like, okay, if that's how it's going to go, then we're going to both going to go down fighting. So I've, now I'm in it. You see, so now I'm feeling like kind of an answer, I guess, to what we're talking about is like a person at some point has to decide to be what Hawaiians call pono. And that means just to be about fairness, about just. And if we, I'm not going to forfeit justice for some kind of momentary convenience. That's, that's, that would make no sense at all. You know, this is a fight that I inherited and it's a fight that'll be going on long after I'm gone. So I might as well make it happen the best that I can and rumble while I can for what I know to be the right thing instead of standing around and wishing people would like me. And that's the other part I think that happens, especially since social media. People, <laughs> people want to be liked. They want to be hearted. They want to be thumbs up. Okay. They, they want to be acknowledged in this fake you know, digital, electronic, vacant thing that, that everybody's glued to. They want that, even though there's nothing in it for them. It doesn't mean anything. What it ends up meaning is that you don't actually get out in the street when you need to get out in the street. It means that you won't put your body on the line when that's the only thing that might stop something from destroying the place you live in. We could talk about Thacker, Thacker Pass. I could talk about Mauna Kea or Red Hill. Like at some point, when that overwhelming machinery has decided it is going to do this to that place no matter what you do, that's when you or I or any of us have to make that decision. Well, if they're going to do it, they're going to have to go through me. And I know you've made that decision. I know I've made that decision more than once where I've said, oh, great. I remember Mauna Kea in 2014 looking at the Homeland Security guys 20 feet away and thinking, that guy has Guantanamo written all over his face, you know, thinking, oh my God, I'm going to get dragged off to some federal pokey because I'm not going to let them do this ceremony, this groundbreaking ceremony. And in that moment, making that decision, okay, if that's how it's going to be, then that's how it's going to be. And I, and I, I don't know how to encourage people to come to that place. And maybe you can help me with this. You can help me with this too, Max. Thank you. Because there is something about being at peace with oneself when you make that decision. You know, it's messy. I don't know what's going to happen here. I'm not giving up on Mauna Kea. I'm not giving up on stopping the state from making a new lease. I don't know what that's going to look like between here and there. But I'm pretty sure that's exactly what I'm going to do. And I'm self-determining enough to say, okay, I'm going to do everything I can to block that process. It's going to have to go through me to get to where it wants to go. And there is a kind of, I don't know, there's a kind of calm, I guess, that comes with making that kind of a personal, conscious choice. I mean, I'm assuming it's like that for you and probably will as well. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's helping me to hear you articulate this because I think that courage is the thing that we need more than anything in this world right now. You know, we need people to find that courage. And 
you know, I was very lucky and I imagine that you have some of this in your background as well. And I want to ask you about it in a second, but my family background is that my grandfather was a conscientious objector. And so I was raised with the stories of this man who dandled me on his knee, who made a choice based on his ideals and paid a serious price for it. Ostracized from his family, kicked out of his entire community, lost his job, sent to a, essentially a forced labor camp. And he did it because he wanted to be right with himself, because he knew that there was higher laws than what was written in the, the draft orders that were sent to him. And despite what you think of his individual decision in that context, it was World War II, what people call the good war, right? So I have mixed feelings about his personal decision. You know, it, it's not all clear whether that's the right thing to do or not for me, but I still take a lot of strength from the fact that he made his decision, right? That he chose his line that he was not going to cross and he drove his picket pin into the ground and he said, not one more step no matter what the cost is. And that takes an immense amount of conviction and courage. That comes from a place of, of love, a place of self-respect, a place of understanding your relationship with your family, your community, the land, the history, the ancestors who come before you, you know, and future generations. And that was the question that I wanted to ask you, Keala, is in the beginning of the book, there's a dedication. And I know um, this person is very important and meaningful to you. So I was wondering if you could talk about who this book is dedicated to and why. Yeah, thanks for asking me that. I don't think anybody's asked me that yet. So I appreciate the question. And I, and I and thank you for sharing that story about your grandfather. That must have taken an incredible amount of courage for him to stand up like that. In that time, especially our rights to self-determination, a Hawaiian manifesto, is dedicated to Haunani K. Trask. People refer to her as Professor Haunani K. Trask uh, because a lot of people have been were her student. Haunani K. died uh, about a little over a year ago now, and she was out of the public eye for at least mm, 10 years before that. And then I'd say even, and, and it was the 10 or 11 years before that that I actually had the honor of knowing her and spending some time with her. She was, for me, the most influential Hawaiian in modern time. She was a terrific orator, but she was also really dedicated to Hawaiian political thought. As a teacher and as a, just a speaker, her work was always focused on making sure that Hawaiians and anybody else listening really understood the history of what the United States has done here. Like her, people who were her contemporaries were like Angela Davis, Ngugi Watiango, Albert Went, who is a Samoan writer and artist who lives in Aotearoa, New Zealand. People like that, Apeli Haofa, these were her influences. I think also probably go down a list of African-American and Native American people who influenced her. But she just had this incredible talent for being able to have a, a political analysis you know, one thing how many K when you, <laughs> if you ever spent time with her and immediately any conversation would turn political within two minutes. And she was very funny and very gregarious and, and beautiful and charming, but she was very political and she would say something and then she'd say right to you, what's your position? She'd want to know, what's your position on this? You know, I saw her once at a, a, a number of us were having dinner and there was this rather prominent Native Hawaiian person also at the table, a uh, professor. And they were having their kind of side conversation. And then ultimately she says to this person, your politics are mamby-pamby. Absolutely insulted this woman. <laughs> but I still laugh when I think of it because that's the kind of person how Nanny was. She would just tell somebody if they were full of shit. And it didn't matter who you were. I mean, that's just sort of a personal anecdote, but she, she really was historically and culturally and politically, I think, the most influential modern Hawaiian. I don't know of any, I mean, I've been influenced by a lot of Hawaiians, but nobody is as profoundly as her. So yeah, I dedicated this to her. And, and I think that when it comes to Hawaiian political advocacy or activism, uh, I'm absolutely influenced by her. So there wasn't anybody else I could have dedicated this to. 
Okay, Kale, I have a few more questions for you. I know we've been on the phone for a while now, but I have a couple more questions. I'm sorry, my answers are so long. (laughs) No, it's great. You've got a lot of important things to say, and I always enjoy sitting down and talking with you. I could keep going forever. (laughs) (laughs) Our listeners would not put up with it if I start putting out, you know, four or five hour shows. (laughs) (laughs) The question that I wanted to ask you is related to what you were just saying. You were talking about your mentors and the people you've learned from. And this is a question that I have been asking a lot of people over the last couple of years. It's a very simple question. I think it's very important. What are your lessons for other people? You know, whether they call themselves activists or community organizers or just regular people who are concerned about these issues. What do you think are the really important things that people need to understand sort of at a foundational level when they're doing this work? You know, what are the, those sort of touchstones or pillars that you keep coming back to that help keep you grounded and moving in the right direction and not getting pulled aside by all the distractions that we see in the world today? What are some of the lessons that you want to share? Oh, man, that's a tough one. I wish I could say, hey, read this book, you know, here, try this, try that. I think that just in this human, in this condition of being human, and especially at this time that we're all living in right now, when we're pulled in so many different directions, you know, in a 60 second, just in in one minute, we can be pulled in 10 directions because of technology. I think technology as we use it is poisonous. It's both necessary and harmful. I find that I have to limit certain kinds of things being being exposed to certain things like social media that's i think a really toxic place and and i only try to use it for political reasons i don't use it for personal advancement or personal um i don't, I, i'm not trying to get famous or popular i only use it because i'm probably just agitating for something And I I take political agitation very seriously. I think it's actually one of the most important political tools is agitation. Because the, the most important thing you can do is unsettle everyone when something's wrong. You got to make sure people shake out of their hypnosis and they and they don't get comfortable with this thing that is what we would call heva, meaning wrong. But personally, I think that, you know, the Hawaiian word is na'au. And that means your guts. But it also means like for us in Hawaiian tradition, I guess, or in our culture, the na'au is where like you get that intuition, you get that feeling, you get that knowing. For Hawaiians, we actually think of that as part of our, like our thinking comes from there. A lot of times a Hawaiian will refer to like maybe one of their kupuna, an ancestor, is talking to them in their gut, in their na'au. And so a Hawaiian, you often will hear a Hawaiian say, in my na'au, I think this. I must say this because in my na'au, I feel this. That is something that every single living thing is born with. Every human has this thing in their gut inside of them, something inside of them that tells them when something's wrong. And the problem right now, as I can see it, and I can just attest to it because I have to deal with it, is that we're so inundated with so much technical, technological so-called advancement. And then we have all these, it's like having a hundred things coming at you at once. I mean, I don't even, I feel, I fear for children now who will never have known a life without this technology, always trying to tell them something or making them look at something, constantly distracting them. Hey, look at this over here, not that. And so it's like having advertisers like Madison Avenue is in everybody's phone at all times. It's talking to you, chatting to you, trying to sell you something. And the thing about the na'au is like, it's subtle. It's not always like, this big, heavy feeling that tells you, oh, don't turn right, you're going to get in a car accident. It's not always like that. It's subtle. And if you're overwhelmed by the noise that is constant, then you're not going to maybe notice it. And so you're not going to listen to your own body. And if you don't listen to your body telling you the truth about something right now, then you're never, you know, it's like take, it's like that Bruce Springsteen song where he says, I took a wrong turn and I just kept going. 
that's kind of where we end up in this life. We all just take a wrong turn and keep going, kind of like what we were talking about earlier when I was asking you about why did people still go along with Obama or anybody else? They just keep going. Instead of, you know, pull the brakes and go, hold on a second, time to regroup before we die. And I think we, you know, I get annoyed at things like climate change. I, I don't even like the term. The climate did not change its mind. Something is being done to this this environment that we're just part of. And, and so it's not a change, it's an assault taking place. And so if we're not just in touch a little bit with our own selves to where we can hear inside of us, like this feels wrong. In addition to that though, you have to value, <laughs> like you have to say, oh, if it feels wrong, I'm not gonna do it instead of it feels wrong, but I'm still gonna do it because it's gonna profit me or I'm gonna get something else out of it down the line. If I just ignore this thing inside of me telling me something's wrong because I have this other goal. We need to get out of our egos, I guess is what I'm saying, because that's ego taking over actual ancestral knowledge that lives in the guts of you. We know what we need to know. We just deny it. Another long answer to your question, but yeah, those are my, that's like the best I could say to somebody is, you know, listen to your gut. Don't question that. It is never wrong. So don't question it. Just accept it and act accordingly. And that's where faith comes in. That's where that's where life happens. And if there's anything called a miracle or magic, it's going to happen over there, not in the part where you're denying what your body is telling you. Thank you so much for that. I, I'm reminded of how powerful it was for me as someone who grew up. You know, I grew up in a family that was very open, uh, spending a lot of time in the natural world. We were very open. I, I didn't grow up religious but I would say I grew up in a family that went to the forests and went to the beach, you know, and that was our, our place of worship. That was our, our, our temple, our church, our, uh, our synagogue. And, you know, even so there was a time when I was in my early twenties where somebody gave me permission to go deeper into that. And they said, go talk to a tree, go talk to the stream and listen. And I had never had that permission before. I think that's something that we all do as children. I think when we're in that sort of state of being, state of purity before the pollution of a industrial techno culture comes into our minds and separates us from the world where we're connected to everything happening around us. We're connected to the people, to the birds, the trees, the sky, every, you know, the buildings, everything, we're sort of taking it all in. I had pretty profound experiences of opening myself up and just listening. Like you say, getting away from the technology, away from a book or somebody else telling me what to believe or what to think and going out into the real world and listening, being open to those feelings and thoughts and energy that would arise within me. And that has been such a strong guiding force for me throughout my work, my life, you know, whether it's relating to very personal matters of friendships and family and relationships and how to conduct myself in certain situations or the things I choose to do, how I spend my time, et cetera, et cetera. Or whether it's more in this political context of the type of work we're talking about. There is this sort of deep wisdom, whether you want to say it's within all of us or it's it's in the world itself and we're sort of accessing it or we're part of it, we're channeling it. I don't know what language you would use, but I feel that very strongly. And in many ways, the work at Thacker Pass, for example, was driven for me by dreams and feelings that I had when I was out on the land there and opening myself to the place and, and letting it speak and listening so I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up, Kale, and that you said what you said, because I think that is so incredibly important. And that is such an important part of tearing off this sort of crust of the dominant culture that we live in that has deeply colonized and desecrated you know, our own psyche, our own mind, our own soul in so many different ways. Yeah, and I think, and yeah, I think it's an ego-driven cultural norm now you know that I mean I'll blame technology but it really just kind of brought it out in people this 
this desire to just be, I don't know, somehow sort of seen, I guess, even though they're not being seen at all. It's this thing about saying, I'll, I will, God, I'm reminded of that Pink Floyd song. I think it's called Wishing You Were Here. And he says, there's that line, <laughs> there's that line in there where he says, he says, did you give up a walk-on part in the war for a lead role in a cage? There's not even that many words in that song, you know, but that, I just, I think about that when I, whenever I see another Hawaiian going over to the other side like that, that I think about that, that line, you know, like, and, and I, and there's a song at the beginning of the little book that I talk about the Breda is his version of Hawaii 78, you know, where he's, he's saying to Hawaiians, Try to see Hawaii through the eyes of our ali'i. How would they feel? Meaning, hey, Hawaiian, feel this. And all Hawaiians feel it. But I think one of the reasons, you know, we have all these health problems and, you know, we're over-incarcerated and just mental issues and all of it. We have all these, just the crisis of Hawaiian well-being is, all, is constant, okay? And I can attest to the fact that it's a real thing. What happens is, when you're in a colonial situation, it's probably the same thing up in Indian country. When you're in a colonial situation and every day it gets clearer and clearer that you pretty much have, have no power, you have no agency here unless you assimilate into it. What that does to the Hawaiian is it makes us want to just numb ourselves. It makes us just want to anything to just take the edge off of that because that's a kind of hurt on a person's spirit. And once you crush a person's spirit, Either they will do for you, do for the person doing the crushing what you want them to do, or they will just die from the grief of it. And then at some point, just suffering the grief of that absence of power and that oppression becomes preferable because at least you're not agreeing. So then the native in that situation ends up hurting the native, right? We just end up, that's why we have these high rates of suicide. We just end up dying from it. You know, how in any case said that, uh, that film I made, Noho Heva, she says that so clearly about resistance being something that you have to do. But she also says it kills you to do it. Like it does something to you. I feel conflicted, okay? I'm talking about the na'au because that's real. But I also feel conflicted in that moment of having to make a decision whether or not to, for instance, like publish this essay, Right? And then all the hundred decisions that come after that. And then the hundreds of hours that go into that. Like in that moment of making that decision, I'm conflicted. Because this part of me goes, yeah, of course, do it. Because this, this, and this is going to happen. It's going to be such a good thing. And this other part of me that has experience, that has life experience goes, oh girl, you go in there, you're going to get fucked so bad. It's not going to be a pleasant kind, right? So it's like there's this conflict inside of me that says... Do it, don't do it, do it, don't do it. And then I have to listen really carefully and say, really, what's the right thing to do? Like take myself out of the whole scenario and look at it from far back from an ancestral perspective, which by the way, I, I have arguments with all those people that I've walked on to forever, like burdening me in a way with this kind of knowing, right? I have to step back and go, okay, if I take myself out of this, the right thing to do is this, this, and this, you know? And then I have to get back in it, and then I have to endure. So it's kind of this conflict that never ends. But once the decision gets made, I will do my best to stay with it, right? But it's, God, it's just like this never-ending process. But I also, by the way, having said that, the upside of resistance, and you can confirm this for me, is that it's, it's an art form. It's this creative, amazing art form it's where you show up as your whole self when you do it where everything else has to get pushed aside in those moments of clarity and i you know i really admire you and will you know whenever i see online what thacker pass looks like when i see some of your video posts where you're talking about what you saw that morning and you're showing us I think that's the moment that you're in when you're doing that, where it's just everything else just gets pushed off to the margins and it's very clear what is happening there and what's at stake and how 
immeasurably beautiful it is, how sacred it is. And that I think is the upside of resistance is that you in that moment get to experience that and then articulate it for the rest of us. Like the purity of that is art to me. That's like an art, an artistic thing. Well, it's real experience too. I mean, so many people in our culture these days are living inside of a manufactured experience, you know, a completely curated experience that's driven by capitalism, whether it's whatever they're shopping for, whatever they're buying, they're spending time in stores, then they're on their phones and using apps and different websites, then they're going to work and rinse and repeat. And, you know, <laughs> Most people are very, having very few authentic human experiences in their day-to-day -day life, whether it's conversations with people and relationships or spending time in the natural world or experiences of community and so on. And, you know, just to jump back a little bit to what you were saying earlier, one of the things that has struck me the most at Thacker Pass, spending time with some of the Northern Paiute elders out there and learning a little bit about their culture, just a, you know, just a few, a few things, is that the ability to shepherd a culture forward, to guide a culture in a good way, to raise young people to be full adult human beings in control of their own faculties, in relationship with themselves, in good relationship with themselves, with their family and their community, and in good relationship with the land, is an incredibly difficult thing. It's very complex. And to do that over generations and generations successfully is an incredibly complex achievement. When I contrast that to the complexity of, say, building one of the nuclear-powered aircraft carriers that is part of the Pacific Fleet that docks not far from where you're recording this interview, th that complexity pales. And it's sort of this very superficial form of complexity that sure is impressive in its own way. It's powerful. There's no doubt about the power of the military force, about the power of these different technologies and so on. But ultimately, it's misguided. It's ultimately suicidal and omnicidal. I'm struck by that when I meet these people who are true elders, you know, not just elderly people or older people, but who are true elders, who really hold on to the old stories, who really know how to use their wisdom to guide those who are coming after them and those who are growing up around them. It's a really humbling and beautiful thing to see. And it's so rare. Yeah, you're, you're really fortunate to be having those experiences, you know, being influenced by them. You're being blessed by them. To me, an influence, being influenced in that way is a blessing. And you're getting something that's ancient that's being shared with you in that, in those kind of moments and that kind of knowledge. And you reminded me when you were talking just now about this need and this process of helping young ones starting from small kid time up to think and be in this way that will enable them to have that kind of whatever resistance or protective skill that they're going to need in order to maintain whatever's left or protect whatever's left. But I'm reminded of apartheid. And it was the children. People forget that. We all think Mandela, Mandela, right? It was the children. It was children marching. And I love the way those guys used to march. They would dance and they would sing and they would chant. That was a march in South Africa against apartheid. And it was literally children. It was also, sadly, the massacre of children, the massacres of children who were doing that kind of resistance but it was the children who came out. And that's the power of that kind of clarity, right? When you're a kid, you have a kind of clarity that, like you said, it hasn't been done to yet. You also have as children, we all have had it, where we have a sense of our entitlement as a human being before somebody crushes it. You know, we have, there's a moment in every child where you can, I can look at a little kid and just know like, oh, they're still themselves. They haven't had it taught, yes, no, yes, no, yes, please. You know, they haven't had that done to them yet. They still go around thinking like, yeah, of course I can be in this room. Of course I can do what I want. And I, that's a, man, I love those kids. Whenever I see a kid, I, I'm one, somebody who sees a kid, I see a kid in the supermarket making a noise. I'm like, you go, give them, you go little one. Cause pretty soon they won't be having the, that in them. Right. And um, so, you know, you, you reminded me of that when you were saying that, and that's really, 
it's, it's just, it's going to get harder and harder with each generation, I think, because of technology. I end up sounding like some Unabomber type person talking about technology the way that I do. And I don't mean to, but it's the truth is how people use technology. It's really toxic and, and it's addictive, just like a lot of toxic things are. And, and at the same time, I know that we can stop that. And I'm always looking for like, what's that point? I'm looking, it's the Hawaiian word for a hole is puka, as in like those puka shells, you know, that's why it's called a puka shell. So it's like, I look for the puka, where is it? Or where's the part where I can make one? Because I know there's a place where if we all lean at the same time, we can change things. I know absolutely with certainty that if and when the Hawaiian people stop the so-called state from making a new lease so they can perpetually desecrate Mauna Kea, I know that in that moment of stopping that, there will be something massively powerful unleashed in the imagination of tens of thousands of Hawaiians. And that becomes the fuel that then begins the deoccupation of Pohakuloa training area. Then it becomes a deoccupation of what's known as Pearl Harbor. You see, it beca- it's a process. And I think that's one of the reasons I say I, what I do about technology, because it, it blocks that creative process of thinking something through to the part where you can see yourself winning on the other end. You have to believe that you can succeed in order to proceed. When I see no resistance, I think it's because the people don't believe they can succeed. And I'm always trying to figure out how do you inspire that, start that fire in their belly. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting too, because I think the definition of success is so different for different people. I think when you're taking, for me personally, it has been so important to shift away from a mindset of winning in some sort of crass sense, simplistic sense, and to understand that the only way to guarantee a loss is to not even try, right? The only way exactly. to guarantee that everything will only get worse and move in the wrong direction is to do nothing. And that every action that we take does matter, whether it's a failure or a success, again, in that crass sense, every action that we take, every time somebody stands up and says, this is the wrong thing to do, we need to be moving in a different direction. That action matters. In a, in a very real way and has echoes that maybe, maybe you won't understand at the time, maybe you'll never understand, maybe you'll never experience the ramifications of, of those actions, but that every action like that matters. Yeah. And to not be attached to, you know, I hate this kind of new agey bullshit about, you know, don't be attached to an outcome. I'm definitely attached to an outcome of winning, but I can't really say what winning looks like. You know what I can say? I know what losing feels like. And I hate losing. It's amazing how experienced I am at it, considering it's like one of my least favorite things to, you know, do. But, but I do agree with you. It's like, mm, you know, if this way doesn't work, then I might try another way, you know. Um, and the point is you do stand up and you show up. And that's the other thing. Technology makes people not show up. It makes people use social media as like as if they're being activists on it. No, you can't be an activist on social media. You can tell people some things, but the activism is the physical part where you need to show up and you need to stop something. And that's actually the most human experience is to stand up for something, you know. We're just being trained and and inundated with all these different ways to not actually do the right thing, you know. So I think if one is just sort of can open their minds to maybe just trying something different and and considering the fact that you actually can stop a telescope and if you can stop a telescope, you can get the rest of them off of there too. And if you can do that, then you can probably do that for a few other places here. And if you keep doing it, then eventually you're going to realize you can get your country back. Wait a minute. They don't have any power over me unless I give it to them. And yeah, somebody can physically oppress you, but you don't have to give them the other part of you, which is the real you, the all of you. You can say, no, I can imagine something else and I'm going to fight you on this. And that's empowerment. That's agency, right? And so, yeah, I might not be able to see the outcome. I might not live to see the outcome. And I promise you, I will probably resent every bump in the road because that's just how I roll. I'll be like, come on, this again? But that, then I'll just brush myself off, you know, and move forward. You got to keep moving forward because if you stop moving, that's 
death. You see, that's the guarantee that you will not succeed. So I agree with you completely. Like, it's a fact. If you don't resist, you know, forfeiting is losing. It's just another way to lose. So if I have an option, either lose, agree to lose, or do the other thing, I'm going to do the other thing. And that's, I think, you know, people need to just understand, like, that's, that's actual power. And accumulating more material stuff and consuming more material stuff, that's not power. And, and that's a, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough thing, but it's the most important thing I think people need to grasp is like your personal power ma matters. So be conscious in it, own it, I guess, for lack of a better word, you know, embrace it and then do what you can with it. Do the best you can with it and try not to be just about yourself, you know, <laughs> try not to be egomaniacal about it. I think, you know, the stuff I've been saying in public lately about, Jason Momoa and his project, it's like, I, I feel like I'm talking about an egomaniac. And it's, it's an uncomfortable thing to call out somebody that famous and rich and powerful. Or Dwayne Johnson, same thing. You know, they're just corporations. They're just bodies carrying around a corporate agenda. They're not on about the people. They're on about exploitation. And it makes me really uncomfortable to do that. But then I remind myself, well, that's an egomaniac. Well, that guy's a narcissist. So maybe I should say that because somebody should check his game and maybe some other people will start to check him too. And it won't just be me. It's not personal. You know, it's a political reality that we're dealing with here. It's a cultural, spiritual reality here for Hawaiians. So we should check each other. We should always check each other. Absolutely. Yeah. I was reminded by what you were saying a minute ago of this idea that someone sent to me or I stumbled across many, many years ago. And I used to reference it a lot. I hadn't thought about it in a while, but the, the quote is simply that the master has failed more times than the beginner has even tried. And that was such an important idea for me in my activism early on because it allowed me to continue on. It allowed me to not get paralyzed by failure and recognize that failure is an essential part of the process of getting to success. You will not get to success without failure. It's impossible. So yeah, I really appreciate your wise words, Kayla. And, and that's the artistry of it too. I mean, the artist fails, you know, it's never a first draft. It's a last draft, right? That one goes with or whatever. It's like the whole process is about, you know, just being in the process, being willing to be creative in that. And whether it's creative problem solving or whether it's with words or as you do with photography or other people with painting or whatever, it's a process. And if, and if one just looks at it in a certain way, it's like, if you look at somebody's canvas when it's half done, you're like, ugh, you know? It, it, it might not look like anything. You won't know till it's over, you know? And you have to keep showing up to know the outcome to something. Absolutely. I'm, I've published a lot of bad photographs, bad essays. I've had a lot of uh, political conversations and attempts at organizing that were total failures. I've organized events where zero people showed up. Zero, <laughs> not one. <laughs> me, right? But that's how you learn. That was, those were my beginner attempts, you know, 10 or more years ago now. And, and that's how you learn is by failure. And I, you know, I'm sure you've put out video content or something that you, you you're not particularly proud of in retrospect. Most of it, yeah. We all do. We all yeah. do, right? You do it because of what it is, right? You know, that's where it's. You know, it's not about your ego, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you know how to take yeah. a beautiful photo, so we know that's not the issue, right? Um, and it's like, yeah, you just so much. I'd say 95 percent of whatever I've put out has been like an abysmal artistic failure, but the message. The reason, like that stuff is porno. And, and if you're doing it in that right way, even if one person or no people, something's going to come out of that. And, and because you know you're doing it in the right way. Absolutely. So, Kayla, I, I think I'm going to try and wrap this up. But if it's okay with you, I would like to ask you if you're willing to read an excerpt from your book. I have an idea, which is the, the last bit the last couple pages of the book but if you have another section of the book that you are particularly proud of or think is important or relevant to our conversation i'd love to hear you read uh any excerpt of the book wow that's that's interesting that's a i can do that i think it's been a while since i've read it but i did go across the room and grab a copy that last part so 
the part, the page that starts with how does the beginning of Hamlet's soliloquy go? Is that the pages you're talking about? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, but I'll mm-hmm. completely leave it up to you. And So much of it is this heavy kind of historical political stuff, and I don't know how well that would read. So yeah, okay, I'll go ahead and read this. Hmm, okay. How does the beginning of Hamlet's soliloquy go? After he asks the heaviest question a human can, to be or not to be, he says, quote, whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take up arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them, unquote. Accepting fake apologies from the U.S., agreeing to any form of federalization, or taking money as reparations, instead of demanding pono, meaning justice, and restoration of our rights to be self-determining, would be suicide. Our fortune is being Hawaiian, Kanaka Maoli, Oivi, indigenous. Only we can decide how to live what that means. The opening lyrics to Hawaii 78, Ua Mao Kea Okaaina Ika Pono O Hawaii, give us chicken skin, especially when Iz sings it, because the words are true. The life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. It is the motto of the Hawaiian kingdom, first spoken by Kamehameha III at Thomas Square, when the Paulette affair officially ended and the Hawaiian flag was raised in celebration. Like everything Hawaiian, our motto was stolen and remade. Now people think it's the motto of the state of Hawaii. But the intent of those words, like our rights as a people, remain, o mau kea o kaaina iko pono, o Hawaii, can only ever truly represent the sovereignty of the Hawaiian people, because only the Hawaiian people will perpetuate the life of this land. That is the truth of us, the best expression of our peoplehood and nationhood. It is how we lived in the past, and now we must choose to make it our future. It is righteous. It is in the blood and bones of us. It is our heritage, not theirs. Hmm. I've never read that like that. I hope it came out okay. It did. Beautiful and powerful. Thank you so much. Mahalo nui to you. and It's been such a pleasure. It always is fun talking with you, Max. <laughs> Somehow I end up feeling better, even though I, it doesn't. None of this feels good. So I really appreciate you know you taking the time to talk with me about the book and about the different issues taking place in our world. Well, thank you so much for joining. I really enjoy the conversations too, Kayala, and it is a solace to our wounded hearts always. You know, to find people and speak with people who are grappling with these same issues, whether they're on the other side of the world or or wherever else. I really enjoy and appreciate your work. The book was absolutely fantastic. It's very short if people didn't get that sense already. It's only about 12,000 words long. So it's a, it's a couple hours read. It's very powerful. I would highly recommend it, especially to anyone inside the United States, the so-called United States, anyone who lives in Hawaii. It's a very, very powerful and important piece of writing. And Kella, where can people learn more about your work and what other kinds of things you've got going on? I know you've been helping with First Voices Indigenous Radio. What else have you been up to lately and what's coming up for you? Uh, They can go to annkellakelly.com if they want to get a copy of the book or read some things that I've published in the past. The truth is, you know, somebody asked me that question a couple weeks back or about a month ago, like, well, what's your next project? What are you working on? And I'm like, I'm still on this. You know, I'm, I'm hopeful that by January, I'll be able to shift back into working on a project that I had to put on hold because of the pandemic. So my, my goal is to get back and that's a project, uh, speaking of First Voices Radio, uh, Teokas and Ghost Horse, it's a film project about him. And so I want to get back onto that project and I have to do a little bit of fundraising for that. So my, my hope is that, you know, six weeks from now, I'm able to Um, just focus more in that direction. But right now I'm so in this kind of uh, thick of this political agitating campaign I have going on that I almost can't see that far, even though that's only six weeks away. So 
that's that's what's going on with me right now. Yeah. Well, thank you again. It's always really a pleasure to have you join the show. This is your second time on the show and also just to catch up with you. I, I really enjoy it personally and I think the listeners will get a lot of it out of it. So thank you for sharing your wisdom, sharing your stories, uh, sharing this book with the world, your, your films that you've created over the years. I really look forward to seeing and hearing more about what you're working on next and hopefully seeing you again in person sometime. It's been since 2014, I think, in San Francisco. Yeah, it's been a long so time. At some yeah. point, we'll cross paths in person again. Hopefully next year. We'll try to make something happen next year in 2023. Sounds good. All right. Aloha and hui ho malama pono and stay well and get yourself well. Thank you, Kayla. This is Max Wilbert, one of the hosts of the Green Flame podcast. I want to thank you for listening to our show and let you know a few ways that you can support the Green Flame. First, you can subscribe to our platform using the podcasting system of your choice. We're listed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pocket Cast, and all the rest. We're even on YouTube. Leaving us a positive review or rating on these platforms helps us reach a larger audience. You can also share these shows with your friends. If you're interested in donating to support the production of The Green Flame, please visit deepgreenresistance.org. And finally, the goal of this show is to activate people. So if you really want to support this show, start organizing in your own community. Thank you again for listening.